Alongside the dice, pencil, and paper, miniatures have been a big part of Dungeons and Dragons since the very earliest days of the hobby. But getting into collecting minis can be just as daunting as getting into the hobby itself. So welcome to our ultimate guide to miniatures for Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role-playing games. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we're talking about miniatures. Miniatures are my favorite game aid for Dungeons and Dragons. They can be used to help you position yourself in a complex battle, or to just plant the seeds for your imagination for your great heroes, your incredible monsters, or amazing locations. They're a wonderful visual representation to use on the tabletop, and a fantastic hobby on their own as both collectibles and a creative outlet if you're interested in painting miniatures yourself. Well, miniatures have been part of Dungeons & Dragons since the very beginning of the game, they are an optional accessory. They're not necessary for playing D&D. In fact, you don't even need miniatures to have the quote-unquote definitive Dungeons & Dragons experience. Most brand new D&D players will often settle for pencil, paper, and imagination before diving into the miniature collection. Even though Kelly and I have been collecting miniatures for years and we have a pretty big collection, we don't use miniatures all the time in our games and we certainly don't use them for every single conceivable scene. Miniatures are great for combat encounters and set piece battles and complex dungeons, but many scenes such as role playing or exploration or puzzles are best kept through the theater of the mind where your imagination can create everything for you. There's no reason to lay out an elaborate set piece for a shop that the players are going to go into to go shopping with an interesting NPC that they've met. This is all something that can happen in your imagination. Miniatures are excellent for a tactical combat experience, and if you enjoy thinking about positioning and strategy, they're a really rewarding element of the gameplay. Miniatures can also really help out if you're a DM who has a lot of things going on on the table during a big epic battle. This is where it might be useful to know exactly how far away people are from each other, how many people are in the 20 foot radius of a fireball spell. If we look at the board here, we can see exactly how these things are going to play out. We also enjoy creating setups involving our miniatures, terrain, and other props, which create a beautiful and evocative setup for our set piece battles and epic encounters. We often take photographs of these setups and they make a great archive and record of the awesome memories that we had playing in those games. Collecting miniatures can be a very rewarding hobby, but it can also be a very time consuming and expensive hobby. So how do you get started? There are so many awesome options out there, from the classic hand-painted metal figures that have been with us from the beginning, to the newer pre-painted plastic miniatures, as well as great alternatives, such as paper miniatures or 3D printed figures. We're gonna give you an overview of some of the most prominent options that are available, so you can choose the right one for you that fits within your style, time, and budget. We're going to look at how much these options cost, how durable they are, and how good they look, and where you might be able to pick them up. We're going to cover a little bit of everything, but this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the miniatures, manufacturers, and makers that are out there. There's hundreds of them. But we're going to look at some of the most prominent options, and if we have missed one of your favorites, please give us your recommendations in the comments below. So let's get rolling. We're going to start off with probably the biggest part of our collections, and that is pre-painted plastic miniatures. These are the official Dungeons & Dragons miniatures that are commissioned by Wizards of the Coast and manufactured by a company called WizKids. Paizo also has a line that is made by WizKids too for the Pathfinder game. And the miniatures are in the same scale, they're pretty similar, and I use them side by side all the time. They're called the Icons of the Realms line for D&D and Pathfinder Battles for Pathfinder. These miniatures are available at most local game stores and they come in these little booster packs that contain four minis per box and are randomized. 
Each box will always contain three medium-sized or small-sized creatures, as well as one large or huge figure. Wizard of the Coast releases these miniatures in sets of 44 miniatures, and each set has been themed around one of the adventures that has been released for 5th edition D&D. So we have sets for Tomb of Annihilation, sets for Storm King's Thunder, and sets for Waterdeep Dragon Heist and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. The miniatures are based on the official 5th edition artwork, so there's even miniatures in the set to represent the non-player characters in the modules like Strahd, Asarak, and even Volo. <laughs> this can be really helpful because if you're planning to run a particular campaign, you can go out and get a whole bunch of booster packs from that specific module. Now keep in mind that these are sorted by rarity, so you're more likely to get things like bandits, kobolds, goblins, and the low-level creatures than you are to get some of the very prominent NPCs or the beholders or dragons that you're looking for. This isn't necessarily a bad thing because everybody could use more bandits and basically cannon fodder enemies. However, if you are looking for the specific NPC that you want for that module, it's going to be a little bit harder to get. This is where the secondary market comes into play, because there's many great websites such as Miniature Market, Meeple Mart, Troll and Toad, and others that will actually sell single figures from opened up booster packs. Oftentimes these have a little bit of a higher price tag than if you would bought a bunch of booster packs. But the advantage is that you're going to get the figure that you're looking for. So if you have your heart set on that Beholder or Strahd or otherwise, check out these websites. We'll have the links in the description below and you can actually find the figures that you're looking for. There's a really great website called Miniatures Gallery that has a list of all the figures in all the sets organized by rarity so you can figure out exactly which figures you might want to get and plan around that. If you just want to get a big stock of common and uncommon figures like the orcs and bandits, those are usually only about three or four dollars per miniature, sometimes less, whereas the rarer figures like Strahd and Asarak and player characters can often be around 10 to 20. And then there's really rare premium figures like dragons and beholders that can be much more. That said, if you've got your heart set on something, it is worth it. There is another option. If you're setting out to run a particular module and you want a whole bunch of minis from that module, you can buy an entire case of the booster packs. It's going to come with 32 booster packs inside and 128 minis. And you're guaranteed to get at least one of every mini in the set. You're also going to end up with five or six of the common miniatures in the set, so you're going to get the really nice figures that are in it, as well as a bunch of the figures that you actually want to have multiples of. Getting a full case is usually around $350 to $400 US, so it is an expensive option. It's what I do personally because I'm a fanatic and I love collecting miniatures, and that way I get every single figure in the set, and oftentimes I'll trade or give away the extras that I don't need to my friends. It's a little bit more of an upfront cost, but it really reduces the randomization of buying individual booster packs and hoping for the best. Every set of miniatures also includes what's called the case incentive figure, which is thrown in when you order a full case, but you can also get it separately. This figure is usually a premium, huge or gargantuan figure that is really something special. So this is where I was able to get my Kraken figure or my Ancient Red Dragon or my Niv-Mizzet figure. These figures are usually 40 or $50 on their own, but when I pre-order my case of miniatures, it's thrown in as a bonus on top. As far as quality is concerned, the pre-painted plastic miniatures are pretty durable and pretty well painted. The larger figures and the rarer figures in particular often have paint jobs that are comparable to what you'd expect from a plastic collectible or an action figure, but there have been some pretty forgettable paint jobs in there. Occasionally I will get a little mini that has what I call the crazy eyes. 
I'd say the smaller figures and the ones that are more common, sometimes you can count on a few bad paint jobs in there, but it saves you the time and energy of having to paint it yourself. Yeah, I think by and large, the pre-painted plastic figures are always better looking than most beginner paint jobs if you're painting them yourself, but they are always gonna pale in comparison to an expert level paint job. The Icons of the Realms lines contain some really unique sculpts. There's some of the best giant miniatures out there. There's some of the few places where you can find a miniature like a beholder or many of the unique demons and undead creatures that are part of the Dungeons and Dragons canon. And so I've actually seen many talented miniature painters repaint the miniatures themselves because when you compare the pricing of the pre-painted plastic figures to several of the higher end miniatures that are out there, the sculpts are often as good quality as those. And with your own elbow grease, you can get a really gorgeous looking figure. One thing to be aware of if you're buying pre-painted plastic miniatures is that they can be prone to bendy sword syndrome. The pre-painted plastic miniatures are made of pretty cheap plastic, which does make them durable, but it does mean that some details, particularly swords and spears, are prone to droopage. Another quick tip for those of you looking to get a lot of miniatures really quickly is to check eBay. Oftentimes people that are getting out of the hobby will have a huge yard sale where they're just gonna try to dump all their miniatures for pennies on the dollar. Once in a while I get lucky and I'm able to expand my collection by an entire table full for only $100. Pre-painted plastic miniatures is an excellent option if you're not into painting your own minis. The cost that you put into buying pre-painted miniatures saves you a lot of time, and it is worth that extra money if you have no interest in painting yourself. Wizards of the Coast and Paizo have also made packs of player character figures, such as these ones here, which are the epic level heroes that are based on the pre-mades from the starter set. I have bought entire boxes of these just because I saw a mini in there that I thought would represent my character that I had made very well. And for me, it's honestly worth it to have a mini that, that represents your character. So some of these are excellent minis to represent those player characters, those heroes and adventurers. Yeah, the paint job on these ones tend to be pretty good and they often also include things like spell effects and other bits of pizzazz to them. So I really have enjoyed these pre-painted little packs for player characters and NPCs as well. One thing I do notice is some of these minis that have the spell effects or the electricity or magic just spewing out of them actually look cooler than anything you would get from trying to paint it yourself. Yeah, like I really love like the Aserac figure that has, that, that looks exactly like Aserac on the cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide or the Beholder that's right out of the front of the Monster Manual. Like that these are modeled off of the official artwork actually makes it really satisfying to collect and they're instantly recognizable when you put them down on the table. If you're excited about diving into the deep end of miniature collecting, you may want to look at unpainted miniatures. As the name implies, these are miniatures that you have to paint yourself. They come as bare plastic or metal and it's on you to pick up a brush and fill them with color. There are so many options for unpainted miniatures and a lot of different companies that make these options for you. One of the most prominent manufacturers of miniatures for tabletop role-playing games has been Reaper. Over the years, Reaper have made hundreds and hundreds of awesome miniatures for both player characters and monsters alike. Now, not only do we have these metal miniatures, but they also have the bone series of plastic minis, which you can paint yourself as well. These got a lot of notoriety because Reaper does an almost annual Kickstarter for their Bones line where you can get miniatures for less than a dollar. They're basically made of the same plastic as the pre-painted miniatures, but they come completely unpainted with no packaging when you get the Kickstarter, or then they come in their own packages when you buy them in store. Once you paint them up though, they look really, really great, just as good as a metal figure, although they do suffer from the same bendy sword syndrome as the unpainted. Well, the Reaper line has been a mainstay for many years, WizKids has started creating their own unpainted miniatures. These are the Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures line, and they also do a similar line for Pathfinder called the Deep Cuts. And these are really well-priced and awesomely detailed figures. You get these two packs for about three to four dollars. I think they're five dollars Canadian, which I guess is like two cents US. 
And uh, I really like these because the, in the pack that they come in, you get a low level version and a high level version of the same character. So if this is your player character, you can just level them up. Yeah. And of course they do fantastic miniatures as well, as well, including an awesome beholder that is only $5, assuming you can get your hands on one. One of the biggest issues with unpainted miniatures is that there's simply a massive selection and it can be so hard to find the right figure for your NPC monster or player character. Although it does remove the randomization of the pre-painted minis, so you can actually browse and look for the minis that you do want. Yeah, Reaper Miniatures actually has a fantasy figure finder on their website where you can search in that you're looking for a male or female figure, if they're an elf or a dwarf, what kind of weapon they're wielding, even a rough search by class. And then they'll show you a couple recommendations within their own range. So that can help you find the right figure, but then at that point, it's on you to paint it. There's also a large array of other manufacturers who make unpainted minis as well. You may be familiar with Games Workshop and their Citadel miniatures line that are used in the Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 lines. And buying a box of Warhammer uh, orcs or skeletons can be a great way to get a lot of awesome mooks for your table. The Games Workshop figures are a little bit on the pricey side for unpainted figures, often being about five to $10 on average, even just for like a trooper figure and their character miniatures are really expensive these days because they cast them in plastic and resin that are pretty pricey, actually. There's still a lot of other manufacturers out there, like Steamforge Games, who make the Guild Ball game, as well as Privateer Press, who make War Machine and Hordes, and many of these companies make lines of miniatures for role-playing games as well, or just have great miniatures for their other games that you can really, really easily use for D&D. No matter where you go, an orc is an orc. If you are the kind of person who really enjoys painting, this is an excellent way to get into miniature collecting because now you get to paint your minis the way that you want them to look and it's another added hobby for you to spend your time and energy to actually put into making your minis look perfect. Painting miniatures is fun and rewarding and it's a fantastic way to relax. I love sitting down in front of my miniature painting station, turning on a TV show on Netflix, or putting on a podcast or some music, opening up a drink and just painting. It's a great way to unwind and I really, really love doing it. But it is a hobby on its own. And I don't recommend picking up painting miniatures as just a way to get a great collection of miniatures for your D&D game. A lot of people look at the unpainted minis and they see the price tag on them and compare those to the pre-painted minis and think that they're getting an amazing deal. Yes, they are more cost effective, but you need to keep in mind that painting minis, being a hobby in itself, is much more time consuming. And also you do need to buy all the paints and brushes and workstation required to paint your minis the way that you want them. This means that it can really ramp up the costs. Nobody's gonna break down your door for using unpainted miniatures at your Dungeons and Dragons table. However, if you're gonna buy unpainted miniatures to use in your game because you think that they're a cheaper option, I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of alternatives that are even cheaper and look way better than bare plastic and metal at your table. It also just looks silly. I have a few unpainted minis that I probably will never paint. And I don't even like busting them out anymore because it looks kind of weird when I have all these beautiful pre-painted minis and then I have my shopkeep who's a little white brick. As many people in the miniature collecting hobby will tell you, it actually creates a very strange vortex over your wallet, which mysteriously replaces all of your money with hordes of paint pots, brushes, specialized tools, airbrushes, and boxes and boxes of unpainted miniatures sitting in your basement that will never see the light of day. Don't make the mistake of thinking that unpainted miniatures are going to save you money. It is an expensive and time-consuming hobby. A rewarding and fun one, yes, but it is not cheap. <laughs> We've collected a short list in the description below of some awesome other YouTubers who have fantastic instructional videos for beginners on getting into miniature painting. A newer option for collecting minis 
is actually looking at 3D printing. 3D printers have gotten really amazing and they are super cool. And there have been a lot of hobbyists, makers, and creators which have been exploring using 3D printing as a way of creating figures for tabletop role-playing games. And the results have been really impressive. One of the benefits of being able to 3D print your models is that you get ultimate customization. If you're looking for the perfect player character to represent your character that you've spent a lot of time designing and imagining in your head, 3D printing is an excellent way to go. Now, you don't have to go out and buy your own 3D printer and get tons of filament to take advantage of the revolution that 3D printing is creating. Because there's a great company called HeroForge, which has an awesome online character builder that you can use to customize your own 3D printed miniature, which will then ship to you and you can then paint it up yourself. The cost for these is a little bit higher than some of the other options. But for me personally, it's oddly important to have a miniature that represents the character I'm going to play. And spending that little bit of extra money to get a completely customized character is well worth it to me. Yeah, we ordered some miniatures from Hero Forge for our Dungeons of Drakenheim campaign for the player characters, and we were really, really happy with them. They're made of a really high quality plastic that took paint really, really beautifully. And it only took me about an hour to paint each of the figures. And I had a lot of fun doing it, and we get figures that look perfect for the player characters. They all came out really, really well, yeah. although that's also a testament to the painter. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty rubbish painter, but these ones came out okay. The Hero Forge miniatures, if you get them in the premium plastic, they're about $25 each plus sh shipping. They do have a cheaper plastic as well that I can't vouch for. I think you lose a lot of the detail with those ones. And you can also get metal and brass ones that don't take paint as well, but are much more durable and kind of look great as a set piece. Hero Forge is the perfect option for an individual player character that wants to get their perfect miniature, but it's not as good an option for a dungeon master that needs a big, huge collection for monsters and non-player characters. I think the pre-painted and unpainted miniatures are better for that. There's probably not many DMs out there who want to dish out uh, 20 to $40 per mini to get an army of orcs. That said, if you are a dungeon master that does want to 3D print your own army of orcs, you could get your own 3D printer and check out the awesome miniatures that have been created by Miguel Zavala, who has made a 3D printable model that you can download for virtually every single monster in the monster manual. We're gonna include links in the description below to Miguel's work. It's really, really amazing. And he has made 3D printable sculptures for basically everything in fifth edition. Now, obviously, if you're setting out to buy your own 3D printer, the upfront costs are going to be pretty high, but now you have the option of printing out whatever miniatures you want. Well, 3D printing does have some high upfront costs and the filament can range in price and quality depending on how much detail you want in your figures. There is a lot of great knowledge out there and we encourage you to do your research carefully. 3D printing does have some unexpected costs and can be surprisingly time consuming to print a lot of figures out. So measure this very, very carefully before you go out and order a 3D printer only to print five orcs that you never end up painting. Because again, the 3D printer is not gonna paint the figure for you. You still have to paint it yourself. So make sure that you factor that into the whole equation and be really, really wary of the cheap 3D printers because the results from those can be really disappointing. So really this option is for the ultimate hobbyist who's willing to dish out money to get a quality 3D printer and also is interested in diving into the hobby of painting miniatures. Mm -hmm. I think 3D printing is a really exciting hobby and it's poised to change the world in some really amazing ways. But do your research really, really carefully to decide if getting a 3D printer for your miniatures collection is the right choice for you.
We've looked at some pretty premium options so far. Whether you're going with unpainted miniatures, pre-painted plastic figures, or you're gonna try 3D printing them yourself, you're probably on the hook for a good amount of time or money or both. So what about cheaper options for those that are just interested in something to use for tactical combat? Yeah, if you're not interested in putting out all that money, but you still wanna jump into the game of D&D and you want your battle map down and you want something to represent the heroes and villains on your table, there's a lot of cost-effective ways that you can jump into that. One of the simplest and oldest ways is to just use coins or bottle caps and color them in with some colored marker or even glass beads or something simple like that. Others have used things like chess pieces or board game pieces or even Lego as stand-ins for monsters, player characters, and non-player characters. I know a lot of people that already have a large collection of Lego. No, Lego isn't necessarily a cost-effective method because Lego can be pretty expensive. Yeah. But if you're like me and you grew up with it, I have a whole tub of Lego at home. Uh, I don't use it anymore, but if I were to bust that out, I could probably build some pretty cool sets and use all of the minifigures to represent some pretty awesome things on the table. It's not going to look as amazing as a giant red dragon, but the Lego dragon can still get the job done. So if you're looking for a really cost-effective option for getting a lot of miniatures just to have a great battle map that's suitable for tactical play, you might want to look at the Pathfinder Pawns box sets. These retail for around $40 Canadian, about $30 US, and they contain in them 300, roughly, pawns. These are paper miniatures on punch-out cardboard, and then they include the bases to mount them onto so that they're appropriate for tactical combat. And the Pathfinder pawns actually look really, really great. They use official art from the Pathfinder role-playing game rule books and bestiaries, and they have medium, large, and uh, even huge and gargantuan sized pawns. If you want to talk about cost-effective, being able to drop $40 to get 300 miniatures is really incredible. If you're just getting into the game of D&D or Pathfinder and you want to really bolster your collection fast, this is the one of the best ways to dive in, drop a little bit of money, and basically have representation for almost any monster that you can conceivably think of right away. Well, the artwork is Pathfinder specific. They work equally well for Dungeons and Dragons because there's still lots of pawns for things like giant spiders banshees. and trolls and banshees in all the sets. Uh, all the sets actually have a full list of what's in them on the back and you do get multiples of each of them, although they don't give you 300 bases. You only get about 30 or 40 bases, so you do have to switch out which ones are there each time, but who cares? You're getting 300 different pieces of artwork yeah. to represent tons of creatures. Switching out your bases, that's just part of the prep work before your game as a DM. Because they're punch-out cards from a pretty durable cardstock, it's very easy to transport a lot of them at a time. One of the really big problems of regular miniatures is that if you're a DM on the go, it's really hard to bring them to game night if you're not running the game out of your own home. But with Pathfinder Pawns, you just stack them up and put them in a binder or a briefcase and you're ready to go. So if $40 for a bunch of Pathfinder Pawns is still a little too expensive for you, perhaps you only want to get the exact miniatures that you want to represent, it's pretty easy to make your own paper miniature pawns at home. All you need is a printer and some glue and paper. For the cost of paper and ink, you can basically go online, print out some minis, and in, what, 22 seconds, cut it out and slap it on a little base or even just a paper base, and you have a mini ready to go at your game table. I've actually slapped some of these on binder clips before, and it works just great. Printable Heroes has an awesome Patreon page with tons of full-color artwork for lots of different miniatures that are in the Monster Manual, tons and tons of different creatures. I was able to print these out on photo paper so they're nice and glossy and they look really good. This is one that he did that's on the Dungeon Masters Guild for the Xanathar from Waterdeep Dragon Heist. You just print that off, attach it to a base or some sort of stand. You can even just fold the paper and put on a paper clip and it will stand up just fine. And there you go, you've got a full color piece of artwork used as a miniature on your table and it takes 30 seconds of work to cut it out of the piece of paper and, and 
less than a minute to download online. So if all you have is a printer and some paper, you're pretty good to go. If for any reason none of these options work, if you have a collection of board games at home, usually there's enough little pieces in those board games to represent things at your table. I actually uh, know a group that just got started and they are using Monopoly pieces to represent their player characters. Yeah, Wizard of the Coast has actually made a bunch of board games using the WizKids miniatures, which can be a really awesome way to pick up a bunch of the miniatures that are in the pre-painted sets. Uh, if you There's a Tomb of Annihilation board game that uses unpainted and painted versions of the Tomb of Annihilation miniatures. And you can pick one of those up and let's just use that at your tabletop and it works perfectly fine. In some cases, I've seen people use old board games like Warhammer Quest and other board games that have really great miniatures to them and either using those unpainted because they're color-coded or painting them up yourself and using them in your game. It's a great cost-effective way to find actual 3D miniatures. One high-tech option for those who have the ability to do it is to use a digital tabletop. This has been increasingly popular and is a fantastic alternative to miniatures. Many digital tabletops, such as Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds, have an awesome tactical battle map built into the app. And if you have a television set or a projector, it's really easy to set this up at your game table and use this as your battle map in the game session. I've seen some really phenomenal tables that have been built with TVs built into them or projectors mounted over top of the tabletop and then these have been used alongside real miniatures as well. It's really, really cool, although a little bit of an expensive and fancy DIY option. There's some cheap projectors out there, but I think this is a lot of work to set up like that. If you have the ability to do it, it's a pretty cool option. Yeah, there's also a lot of great artwork on those sites that you can just print off and glue onto a bottle cap or a little token from a craft store and just use those as flat pieces on your table just using the art as well. The only thing with paper miniatures and tokens is that they tend to fly away if somebody sneezes or coughs really, really hard. So just be aware of that. I've, I've seen many a tactical battle ruined by an erstwhile sneeze. That's our guide to miniatures for tabletop role-playing games. That's just, it's, this is just a small snippet of everything that's out there. They're some of the most prominent and accessible options. And it's really up to you to decide which one is going to be right for your playgroup. While miniatures can be time consuming and expensive, it is a rewarding and fun hobby. And especially if you get into it as a group of people, splitting the cost or sharing the expenses, or even getting together as an entire group and painting your miniatures together can be a really fun way to expand your enjoyment of Dungeons and Dragons. We hope that this guide was able to shine some light on the options that you have to get into collecting miniatures for your game table. And we hope that with all of these different options, there's one out there that really stood out to you and can really heighten the immersion at your next game. And the number one piece of advice I have, regardless of which solution you choose for your game, is to start small. I have a really big collection of miniatures, terrain, and other props that I use to enhance my game, but I didn't have these things when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. Rather, my collection is something that has built up over 15 years of playing the game, sometimes in fits and starts, and sometimes I've made a big addition to my collection. Start small, get a few miniatures hand-painted for your next group of player characters, and use pawns for the monsters. Then maybe you might want to add a prominent miniature like a dragon or a lich to represent the villain of your campaign. Over time, you might want to add a few miniatures here and there to represent key NPCs or to use in memorable battles in your campaign. After a few years of collecting, one day you'll be able to open up the monster manual to a random page and say, oh yeah, I've got a miniature for that. I should use that one in my next game session and find that there's great inspiration in your collection because you can dust off a figure that you haven't used for a few days, weeks, or months and use that in your next game night. So this has been our ultimate guide to miniatures for Dungeons & Dragons. We've mentioned a lot of different places to grab minis and we'll put them all in the links down below. If we've missed any of your favorites, 
we're personally interested in hearing about them, so let us know in the comments. And these were just our personal favorites. None of the manufacturers or companies we mentioned in this video sponsored this video or asked us to include them in any way. We've just picked the ones that we have personally used in our games over the years. If you're enjoying the show and are interested in supporting the channel, consider becoming a patron of our work. You can find out how in the links below. And if you want to see us using some of these amazing minis in our own game, you can check out our live play Dungeons of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Twitch. If you want to catch up with previous episodes, we have a link to those right up over here. We've also got plenty more tips for new Dungeon Masters for Dungeons and Dragons right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.